The church's business is to save souls and to be the leavening influence for good in the world as seen as in the lives of each member of the church. It is the church that receives the great commission to preach the gospel. It is the gospel that is God's power to save men. And you can't preach what you don't know. And there must be a love of God that supersedes all love for anything or anyone else. And then our love for our neighbor is that we love them as we love ourselves. Thus, in striving to be like Christ, as the New Testament sets him out, then we are to be concerned about lost souls. It's not within our power alone to save anybody. So when the church is to save souls, it means we are the spiritual body of Christ to set out the will of Christ, the gospel, that souls may learn the way God saves them from their sins. Let me say again, as I have many times, that sin is the only thing that can separate any one of us from God. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 Sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is our greatest enemy. Now, we all have problems from time to time of various sorts. They usually pertain to this life. These will pass away. Eternity will not pass away. When you reach eternity, you're there. There's two places to go in eternity. Eternal glory, majesty, and honor. It's beyond our minds to grasp, no matter how much we look into the Bible and try to understand it. And there's the place of the lost, those who die in their sins, unforgiven. Or those who have obeyed the gospel but apostatized, left the faith. Or they've been overtaken in a trespass, they refuse to repent. And come back to the Lord. That place is called hell. Everybody in this room will be in one of those two places. Everybody in this city, in this county, this state, this nation, and the world. James depicts life in the flesh as a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Yet look how much time and effort and mental labor we put into the vapor that vanishes away. We're taught in the scriptures that we should center upon eternal things. We should be concerned about pleasing God for that's the whole duty of man according to the inspired writer of Ecclesiastes to fear God and keep his commandments. We in the church want other people to know the gospel. Yet I have found over the years, true of those who spent their life in what we say is full-time preaching, being supported by the church to preach, that they get despondent. Elders do too, and so do members who seek to teach the truth to the people around about them. It's my opinion, out of experience, that much of that comes because we're trying to do the work that is God's work. And that God does in his word. While we're to preach it. And while the power to save is in his word. It's not in my power to save anybody. Thus my faith in God built upon a thus saith the Lord proposition. Must be also involved in how people are saved. Now James in reminding Christians about things like this. Said in verse 18 of James 1, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And then in verse 21, he said, Receive with meekness the engrafted, or as the American Standard 1901 says, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What's able to save a person's soul? 
It's the Word of God. Now, with all of that said, by way of introduction, I want to look at two different chapters that are not foreign to your minds if you're a Bible student. The first one is in Luke chapter 8. And we call it, most do, the parable of the sower. I like it much better and it's much more accurate as the parable of the soils. Again, keep in mind the Lord is the master teacher. You don't get any better than that. And I want us to understand that he is talking to people, preparing them for the coming kingdom. But he's talking to a people that understood about sowing and reaping. Now, we don't have an agriculture society anymore. People hardly know much about raising a garden. And uh, most don't even care to learn. But there are some things about the gospel of Christ and the teaching of the Bible that you must learn something about those matters of that day and time to get the message the Lord is getting across to us. Well, he talks about a sower. He talks about something that he sows. Now, in uh, English, you know, you can have two kinds of sowers. <laughs> one of them that hurts, and this one we're talking about, is sowing the seed. And I'm going to look at where Jesus interprets that parable of the soils. And I'm going to lump them together to see what he has to say because I'm interested in getting us who want to teach the truth to others, who want to be sowers of the seed, to realize where the power is that saves men from their sins and where my responsibility is ends and those needing saved begins if you don't learn that you'll be out for a great deal of pressure and burdens that God never intended you to bear so they went out in those days the small plots of ground they had their seed and the way I grew up was you talk about broadcasting it well they sowed they actually had a sack of seeds barley, wheat, rye, and they just cast it as they walked. There's an art to that. I think the word would be art. To make sure you don't get it all clumped up and to make sure it's evenly distributed. It takes a little while to be able to do that. Nowadays, if you've got something that involves being sold, it's a small plot of ground. You know, it's like one of the little grass seeders you go along and it distributes it real evenly. But in those days, it was stripped like this. And they would try to pick a good day when the wind wasn't blowing so it would land in the ground that they intended for it to land in so it would grow right. All those things had to be taken into consideration. So there's learning on the part of he who would be a good sower. These people understood these things. The Lord didn't have to go into all that with them. They dealt with it every day of their lives and had for years and years and years. So the parable is this, our Lord says, very simply, the seed is the word of God. Now if you look at anywhere you want to regarding saving souls, it always involves teaching people the truth. But you'll see that there's a responsibility of the teacher and there's the responsibility of the one being taught. You have our Lord many times emphasizing to the person who needs to be taught, to the person who needs the lesson, to the person who needs saved from sins, take heed what ye hear, and take heed how ye hear it. Meaning you better be sure it is the Word of God, and you better be sure you apply it honestly and objectively to your life. So we see what the Word is, or what the seed of the kingdom is. It's the Word of God. There is no citizen of the kingdom of heaven where the word of God has not gone and people haven't understood it and obeyed it. Now, he sets out here for the person who's going to go sow the seed, not get despondent, discouraged, and quit, that as you sow that seed, it's going to fall on certain types of ground. 
certain types of characters or mindsets, certain viewpoints and ideas, and all people have them. He talks about two kinds of ground, actually. One is the way we all want to be and wish everybody was. We'll get to that one at the last. The other is made up of three parts. Notice verse 12. He calls it the wayside soil. What does he mean? Well, it's all the same seed, isn't it? It's all the Word of God. It's all being sown and the seeds falling in different places. So, this he likens to the devil coming and taking away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. You see, faith in Christ hasn't even been formed yet, but they've heard the word. Now, let me ask you this. How does the devil come and take the word out of their heart? Is it some sort of a direct operation of the very being of the devil on your heart that says that man's heard the word of God. I'm just going to give him amnesia as far as that's concerned and some supernatural act takes place. Not at all. Not at all. Do you realize there are people who are so caught up and in love with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that the word of God they hear and understand doesn't make them one bit of difference. And because they care for this present world and the affairs therein, the word never does create belief of any sort whatsoever in Christ in them. You see, the devil's the prince of this world. He works things here to suit himself. So if the word is sown and there are men there who hear it, but it makes no difference to them, what is the difference in that? And just how Christ impressed the Pharisees' chief priests. Didn't impress them at all. And when you see Paul preaching to Felix and Festus and Agrippa, look at the impact that had on them. There was no faith in Christ formed. For faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, in such men. They love this present world. Paul speaks of people uh, saying not many mighty according to this world are called. Well, it's the gospel call. Why? They're not interested. These things seem as foolish as of them, so Paul talks about the foolishness of preaching. Foolish from whose perspective? It's the power of God to save. He's not talking about the act I'm engaging in now. He's talking them about the message preached. It's foolishness unto them. They're caught up in this world and the way it functions. And that's how the devil comes along takes it out so they'll never believe. It's because of their own caring about the present and the here and now and time and space and the appetites of the flesh. That's what they're working for. So, the seeds fall in there, but nobody's saved. Then you look at verse 13. Notice he says, They on the rock are they which when they hear, they've heard, they receive the word, they're understanding, this is the word of God. And they're happy they've heard it. It's what we've been looking for. But this gets a lot of folks here. They're just superficial. You see this rocky ground wasn't like little pebbles all over the place. It's talking about a rock shelf with very little soil on it. So that it can't get a grip. So that it can't have any sustenance and especially water. Thus, these have no root and for a while believe. See, belief's been created. For a while they believe. And in time of temptation, they fall away. It's amazing to me how people can read that. They fall away and say, oh, a person can't fall from grace. Well, that's the very point the Lord's making here. They all hear the same word, the seed of the kingdom. The first don't even believe. The second, they're happy. They've heard it. But they can't stand the trials of life. I've seen it all my life, experienced it with people in the church. They can't stand it. 
the first little bump out of the way, the first flat tire, the first skint shin, the first offended whatever, and they've had it with everybody. What's the use? Why did God do this to me? They never seem to ask this question. Why did the devil do it to me? Why do they, why do they blame on God what is the devil's lot? Why did this tornado blow my house away? Why did God allow that to happen? God, it's the devil doing it, folks. So these go for a while. Down they go. When I look back over all the years, sometimes Joanne and I reminisce about it, of the churches we've been at for over 50-something years. And the same thing's true spring. Just some of us been here a little while. Just think back of the people that are no longer faithful to God. They appeared to be, but they're not. They give it up. Why do they give it up? Does the word have no power? Did they need something beyond the truth of God's will? James says, the word's able to save your soul. Well, it is or it isn't. God lied or he told the truth. But if it doesn't save souls, Jesus is saying, here's why. Now, as a preacher of the gospel, as a teacher of truth, as a soul winner for the Lord, as a sower of the seed, how is that supposed to affect me? It's not supposed to affect me. It does not supposed to stop me at all from sowing the seed. Well, okay. Then we move away from that, that which fell among thorns. Who are they? He says, which when they have heard, see, they everyone heard. But notice again, you see the impact this present world has on many people? Well, they go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Define American. <laughs> and there it is. And it hits the church. You try to get the church to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and see what you run up against. You'll run up against everything the devil has in his power to stop people from being what the word of God says they ought to be. So they're choked with cares. Cares. You know, the Lord talked to Martha a little bit about that one time. He's in the house with Mary and Martha. And you get a picture of the Lord in the living room and others settled around him. And he's teaching. And Mary's there listening. And Martha's doing what any good woman and wife and homemaker does. She's in there trying to feed that crowd. She's in the kitchen. And where is my sister? She's sitting down in the living room. So Martha comes up and says, will you have her help me? Well, didn't the Lord want to eat? Didn't the Lord appreciate the hospitality? But yet the Lord rebuked her. And there's a little book I have called Martha, Martha. And then he shows what the cares of this world are all about. Jesus Christ, the Son of God's in your living room teaching and you're wanting to pull Mary out to come fix a turkey. Somebody's got to start thinking a little different. You just don't have Jesus in the flesh in your living room every day. Bring it down to our age. And think about it. The cares of this world. You know, all cares of this world aren't bad. If you're in the flesh, you've got honest cares. God made you to depend on the flesh and how we work in the body. He even instructs us how these things ought to be. But you see, they take precedence over spiritual things. What's a spiritual thing? Doing what God told you to do and the way God told you to do it and for the reason God told you to do it. If you will live like that, you're living a spiritual life. It's also called being faithful to the Lord. And so these things get so important, cares and riches and pleasures. There's how the devil reaches us. Go read 1 John. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And they bring no fruit to perfection. 
Their interest is given somewhere else. That's where they live. So they dibble-dabble in the church. He gets the leftovers. There's nothing brought to perfection, to completion. And all of these are pictured by our Lord as losing their souls in a devil's hell. Then we come to the one we all look for. Verse 15. Same seed sown. What is the good ground? Which they in an honest and good heart. Honest and good heart. The word heart means the inward man. It's the seat of your very being. It's where your mind is. Your will, your intellect, your rational powers, your emotions, and so on. So it's sown, and they're honest and good. But not many of those around. There's been times in gospel meetings I've said this. We begin this gospel meeting, this meeting pertaining to the power of God to save souls. I'm looking for a few good and honest hearts. They've heard the word. Others heard the word. But notice here, it changes. They hear the word and they keep it. If I were to give you something that would be of great value, would you hang on to it? Would you keep it? Would you appreciate its value? Would you use it for what it is? And they bring forth fruit with patience. Patience here means bearing up under whatever life offers you. It may be because you're a Christian because, as Paul said to Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But you keep on doing it. Why? It's, it's the way of salvation. Why? Your life's a vapor that appears for a little while. This will not go on. It's going to terminate at some point in the future time and space and earthly things. It's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. So if you're going to be a preacher of the gospel, a teacher of the truth, a sower of the seed of the kingdom, a soul winner for Jesus, you're going to have to learn that there's these kinds of people out there. And you cannot let the first three soils cause you to say, well, what am I doing wrong? Why don't they all do this? And you can't even let the members of the church who don't believe Matthew 6, though they can quote it, stop you from doing what you personally know is your responsibility. You cannot let any man in or out of the church stop you from obeying God. It's that simple. But now watch. When you go out to preach, go with me to Luke 15. When you go out to preach, you're going to find people like the sheep that was lost. Verse 4. And a sheep can know it's lost, but it has no idea how to get back home. You're going to run across some people like that as you sow the seed of the kingdom. They're yearning for something. They know they're not happy. They're not satisfied at all with their life, but they don't know what to do about it. They're miserable. They don't know what to do about it. You have the wherewithal if you're living a godly life and preaching the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the gospel, sowing the seed of the kingdom, you have it. So you've got to realize there are people like that out there. Then if you go down here and you find there's a lost coin, verse 8, well, it's an inanimate object. It cannot know it's lost. It has no idea about looking for something good. It's just an inanimate object. There are people out there lost in sin just like that. And as you sow the seed of the kingdom, as you live your godly life before the world, then you've got to realize that some people have no idea about lost. Sometimes we preach, and if you'll listen to us, we preach a lot like everybody in the audience already knows what we're talking about. If you're lost... What does that mean to a lot of people nowadays? I've told this story, but I think it fits very well right here. It's about the two very zealous young missionaries who wanted to go teach the gospel in the place that was uh, 
needing it so badly, and so they, they, they chose up in the Appalachian Mountains. And they go up there, and they come across an old hillbilly sitting on the porch back in the backside of nowhere. And they're so enthusiastic, they say to him, Are you a Christian? And he looks at him and says, No, no, I, I, my name is Black. Mr. Christian lives over the hill over here, if you want to find him. And no, they got flustered and said, uh, No, our... Uh, are you are you lost? He looks at him and said, No, I'm 78 years old and I was born right here in this house. I know exactly where I am. And so they said, Well, how you still don't understand? He said, Are you ready for the judgment? He said, Well, what is that going to be? And they said, It could be today, could be tomorrow, could be next week. And he said, Don't tell my wife she'll want to go all three days. Communication. And yet we use that terminology. Expecting everybody out there. Have you ever got directions from somebody that uh, gives it to you like you already know where you're going? And yet I've had those kind of directions. They give me the directions because, see, I don't know where to go and I've asked how to get there. But they give me directions like I know. You turn down here and you turn left and you go over this hill and you turn back right and you do that and, and you know you don't whatever but they assume you've been down that road like they have 14 times some of you fellas want to try it sometime just get some folks and describe the difference in a cucumber and a watermelon without using cucumber or watermelon without using it tastes like just simply by looks describe it see how easy it is so when we're preaching the gospel, don't assume anything. Nowadays, more than ever years before, know that the sea's going to fall on all this different ground. Know that there are people that know they're lost, don't know a thing they're going to do about it. Others don't have any idea what lost means. But then notice there's the lost boy. He knew he was lost. He knew what he had left. He knew he was in a mess down there in the hog pen, and he could remember the truth he had left. You're going to run across those two. Now, if you don't get these things in mind as a soul winner for Jesus, you're going to be awful upset at yourself and at other people when there's really no use in being it. We are workers together with God. We sow or we water but it's God that gives the increase. And you can't force the door. Have you ever noticed Jesus stands at the door and knocks? Have you ever noticed that picture? Have you ever noticed the portrait? It's out there of Jesus standing at a door and knocking. Have you ever noticed that doorway? The artist did not put any doorknob, if you please, on the outside of that door. There's a reason for that. It's the person on the inside that has the will to open it because he wants to open it. That's the way it is with any teaching. You cannot force it. You can come at a person any way you know how to come at them with the truth in life, doctrine, defending the faith. But if they want that door shut, it's going to stay shut. And it may be barricaded on the other side. You don't force the door. You teach and you lead and you reprove and you re rebuke and you exhort with all long suffering and doctrine but they've got to be the one to show they're interested and that they're teachable and that they'll listen you can't force that you can show them reasons why they should but you can't do that you're taking over God's prerogative because God gives the increase God's word does not return void but God's word preached purely as God intended may very well keep people out you don't want people in the church that don't respond to the gospel that come in for some other reason. You're going to get the wrong people in. You see, the Lord knows how to keep the right people, to appeal to the right people, to the right characters. And you got it in Luke 8, 15. You don't have it in the other three. You got it in Luke 8, 15. So we're always looking for a few with honest and good hearts. And that's what we want to keep ourselves like.
honest and good. Determined to do what's right, let come what may. Not bend to the left or the right. Not compromise. Be willing to repent of sins when we see it in our own lives. That's faithfulness to God as the New Testament describes it. That's receiving with meekness the engrafted word. Remember, that was written when originally written to members of the church. So it's always needful. It always will be. Now, if you become disheartened, if you become discouraged as a soul winner because everybody doesn't get as enthused about things as you do, don't lose your enthusiasm. Don't lose your desire, but don't let other people impact what you do or don't do that's right in your own life. Just keep on keeping on. That's the answer. What anybody else does or doesn't do, why should that impress you? So I hope this causes those even outside of Christ to realize you're the captain of your soul. You're the one that's going to use this life or not use it as God intended to find God, obtain forgiveness of sins and obedience of the gospel by believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ by the authority of the Lord for the remission of your sins. As a child of God, you say, well, I would do more than somebody else would. Where did you ever see the Bible teach such a thing? You lead the way for everybody else to do what the Bible says everybody else ought to do according to your several abilities. You don't let anybody stop you from doing what God said you're supposed to do. There wouldn't be an account of David facing Goliath if David had had that attitude because there was a whole professional army up there of some sort that should have been out there dealing with him, but they weren't. But you don't see David saying, well, if they're not going to do it, don't expect me to. And yet that's what I see in the church, the army of the Lord. If so and so is not going to do it, I'm not. Paul even deals with folks who judge themselves on the basis of what other people do. Well, I'm good as you are, I'm good as he is, or I'm no worse than that one is. No, you judge yourself in the light of the infallible word of God. That's what's going to be our, our standard of judgment someday. So if you're not a Christian, you know now what to do to become one. If you're a Christian and trying to spread the gospel, you know a little bit more, more likely reminded of it, because I think most of you, if not all, already knew it. Don't let things like this stop you from continuing to teach the truth and to study and to grow in knowledge and grace of God. But as a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to repent of your sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Now, who is there really to hinder us from being all that God said we ought to do? Nobody but me. That's really what it comes down to. Really, when all is said and done, it's nobody but me. Well, who's going to obey the gospel? For me. It can't happen. As surely as you had to respond to the gospel call personally and obey it, then you have to do everything else like that too. Even as it regards cooperation one with another, fellowship one with another, and edification of one another. It involves each one doing it to the benefit of everybody else. If you're not a child of God or need to repent of sins, then this invitation is offered to you and think seriously about what we've said while together we stand and sing.